The tides are changing in the DSLR market, and in my hand is one of the reasons why. Hi, I'm Mike Perlman, photography editor of TechnoBuffalo.com. Today I'm going to review the Nikon D800. Is the Nikon D800 one of the new high watermark setters? Find out in my full review. Since 2008, the Canon EOS 5D Mark II has ruled the roost in the world of versatile full-frame DSLRs. Professional photographers and videographers flock to the Mark II for its superb still image quality and HD video quality. Approximately six months later, Nikon released the D700, and while it was a critically acclaimed DSLR for still shooting, it lacked a video mode. So it's safe to say that Nikon has been living in Canon's shadow for the past four years. But the tides have indeed changed, as 2012 brings us the Nikon D800. The D800 brings some crucial upgrades to the table. First off, we have full HD video recording. And Nikon has somehow managed to triple the resolution of the D700 sensor, and the D800 offers 36 megapixels. So let's get cracking and talk about the D800's design. Architecturally, there are a few things to be excited about with the new D800. Most notably, the dual card slots. Yes, the D800 can host an SD card and a CF card, and when one card is maxed out, it'll automatically spill over to the other. If you're in the middle of a video clip, the video will stop and start a brand new clip on the other card. Also, we have this nifty new live switch here. We could switch between video and photo mode to give us a more accurate preview of what we're really going to record. The D800 has a slightly larger 3.2 inch LCD screen with a 921K display. That's the same resolution as the D700, so don't expect much of a difference. I was a big fan of the 100% coverage optical viewfinder, particularly because I could use virtual horizon meters and grid displays. Now as far as an interface, this is a prime example of what an interface should be on a digital camera particularly the eight-way directional pad. It was just so easy to press. Everything is just one button press and a command jog away. Selecting and executing manual controls and adjustments was flash Gordon fast. The menus are intuitively laid out. It was so easy for me to get acclimated. So as far as an interface on an advanced DSLR, one of the best I've ever seen. Now for terminals, the D800 has mic and headphone jacks, and that's going to come in handy for video mode. Also, we have a USB 3.0, so we have the high speed, and we have an HDMI mini out. The mini out's going to come in handy for streaming to an external monitor while you're recording video. And we also have your standard 10-pin connector and flash sync terminal. Now one thing to note about the new D800 is that it relies on the new ENEL15 battery pack, which means you can't use the D700's batteries if you're upgrading from that camera. Also, the battery life has a lower rating than the D700's. The D800 can shoot 900 shots, and the uh, D700 was cleared for 1,000. But of course, Nikon is making a battery grip for this. I looked it up, it's about $450. Now, as far as the D800's body weight goes, it's about 3.3 ounces less than the D700, but don't let that fool you, it's still a cinder block, especially with this giant 24 to 70 millimeter Nikkor that Nikon sent me. I much would have rather had the 14 to 24 that I tested with the D700, but it's not a perfect world. Now let's discuss features. The D800 has the same Nikon Advanced Multicam 3500FX sensor module with TTL phase detection as found on the D700. The camera even has the same amount of maximum AF points at 51. But now the D800 has face priority in photo and video mode, and it has a 3D tracking AF mode, which adds new focus points while tracking subjects. In terms of AF and servo AF, this thing was a speed racer. It was blazing fast. Now, one of the big features about the Nikon D800 is something you'll find on the company's other DSLRs, even down the price range, is that it has full-time AF. Now, the thing about DSLRs and full-time AF in live view is that it's not as smooth as a dedicated video camera. So even though the Nikon D800 was one of the best full-time AF performers I've ever seen, I still prefer a video camera because it's silent and you don't get those grunts and groans from the camera. Now exposure on the D800 has been improved a bit with a new TTL metering system with a 91,000 pixel RGB sensor. Although the maximum ISO range on the D800 has remained the same from the D700 at 25,600, we now have a new low ISO at ISO 50. 
Shutter speed is the same as the D700 with a 30 second slash bulb all the way up to a 1 8 thousandth of a second. One thing I notice about the auto ISO on the D800 is that the camera defaults to lower ISO settings than I would have elected for. So what I recommend is uh, manually setting the ISO, especially indoors. Now, of course, the D800 has other specialty features, such as an HDR mode, but I thought it wasn't really that necessary, especially because there was great bracketing, exposure bracketing, that I could have just bracketed and thrown all the images in Photoshop and done my own HDR images. But you could also do things like white balance, active D-lighting, and flash exposure compensation bracketing, which is pretty handy. Now one thing to note about the D800's continuous mode, it has a max continuous mode of four frames per second, which is one less than the D700's five frames per second. On the other end of the scale, this camera has time lapse and time interval shooting, and it's capable of multiple exposures at up to 10 layers, so that's pretty impressive. As far as white balance control, it was very straightforward. You have your manual and your presets. There was also custom Kelvin control, and you could do it down to the degree, which I thought was great. Of course, the D800 would not be a D800 without vignette control, advanced noise controls at high ISO levels, and auto distortion control. But I pretty much kept all of those in neutral to give this thing a balanced evaluation. Now let's talk about the flash before we get to image quality. The flash, the built-in flash on the D800, I actually was really impressed with it. I know a lot of pros out there are going to put their $500 speed lights on this thing. That's totally fine. I recommend doing that. But if you really need a quick fill flash, the D800's pop-up did a pretty darn good job. And the only thing about a built-in flash with the 24 to 70 millimeter lens that Nikon gave me is that it casted a pretty hefty shadow. So I had to back up and zoom in if I was going to do any um, flash shooting. And now it's time for the most important part of the review image quality. And in order to demonstrate that, right now I'm using the D800 to film this segment and the rest of the review. So from here on out, we're rolling with the D800. Now first let's talk about this beast's sensor. Nikon stuffed a 36 megapixel full frame FX format CMOS sensor inside, which is triple that of the D700's resolution. Images could be captured in RAW, JPEG, or TIFF, and the average RAW size was 50 megabytes, and the average JPEG size was 22 megabytes. Now if you have an 8 gigabyte card, and you shoot it full resolution, full quality, you're going to get about 100 shots. Fortunately, my friends over at SanDisk sent me an Extreme Pro 64 gigabyte SDXC card. In all my years of testing, I've never had any problems with the SanDisk. I always rely on SanDisk. Now, I tested the D800 in a variety of locations, and I was amazed by the detail and clarity with the triple pixel count. Colors and dynamic range were fantastic, but the ISO performance was the best. I could shoot at ISO 6400 with great results. Even the higher ISO values, like 12800, were impressive. And thanks to the high resolution sensor, I was able to shoot at higher ISOs and scale the images down for reduced noise effects. Now when you stack RAW versus JPEG, the RAW files definitely are higher quality. I found colors to be more vibrant, detail to be sharper, and images to possess a higher level of clarity. I shot in RAW throughout the entire testing phase and I was super impressed. The D800, as far as still images, one of the best in the biz. But perhaps one of the most highly anticipated features on the D800 was its 1080p HD video. I shot exclusively in 24 frames per second and 30 frames per second, and I was extremely impressed by what I found. But overall, the D800's HD video quality could be considered for film and commercial work, thanks to its superb image quality. I also love the fact that I could shoot with full manual adjustment, including shutter speed, aperture, and ISO range. Low light performance performance is very impressive, although when I tested it in extreme dark environments I did find noise, so that's something to consider. And also keep in mind that when you compare the video quality from the D800 to its stills, there's really no comparison. With the video quality you find that the colors are not as vibrant and I stumbled across a few more A patterns. It's also a bit of shutter lag when it comes to motion, but this was to be expected as currently there's no DSLR that matches its still quality with its video quality. Now let's talk about the D800's audio situation. I really like the built-in stereo microphone. I thought it performed pretty well. However, you're going to want to go for an external microphone. But one thing I noticed about the 3.5mm audio jack was that when I plugged my microphone in, the floor noise increased. So kind of have this hissing background sound. I think that's something that's characteristic of DSLRs and external audio. If you're really serious about audio, if you want pro audio, get a Beats Tech XLR grip adapter and uh, Bob's your uncle. So now it's time for the Buffalo Call with the Nikon D800. 
It's awesome. For the full review, go to technobuffalo.com. Until next time, I'm Mike Perlman. Keep snapping, folks.